Uh, it's truly a privilege to be sharing my thoughts today with such a, an elite and distinguished audience. I've had conversations with uh, many of you today, and, and it's just an amazing group of people. So thank you all for attending the talk. Thomas Kuhn, in his classic book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, coined the term paradigm shift. As he described it, scientific communities function within a paradigm, largely making incremental advances within that shared, understood paradigm, until there is a sudden and unpredictable shift uh, to a new model or paradigm. Within computer science, we don't have paradigm shifts caused by incomplete theories of the underlying laws of nature. Uh, but we do have paradigm shift caused or driven both by technological limitations uh, and large disruptive shifts in technological capabilities. Okay, for, uh, I've got the notes. There we go, okay. So for generations, people have been building software applications that have largely been able uh, to ignore the low level details of the underlying hardware. Okay, this speedboat here uh, on the, on the uh, slide represents you know, computer science blasting along more and more capabilities every year, making great progress enabling applications, software, new science, new discoveries, all the things that we've been hearing uh, during this, during this uh, faculty summit. Uh, today I will argue that we're moving into an era uh, where the physics and the underlying hardware will drive a paradigm shift uh, that will affect many or most researchers in the field eventually. Okay, and for my architecture and hardware colleagues uh, in the audience, I apologize. Many of you will be familiar with these concepts. I aim this talk at a general computer science audience. Okay, so the beast from below is transistor scaling, uh, but I think there are opportunities uh, to defeat the beast from below if we work together across the boundaries of the field. And that's what I'll talk about today. Okay, so uh, we have the standard computing stack. Yale Pat loves to give this in, his, uh, in many of his talks. And uh, we start at the bottom with devices, and I don't mean devices like uh, you know, smartphones. I mean silicon devices, transistors, memory cells, and whatnot. You know, we're a devices and services company. But in that sense, we, uh, Microsoft means the other kind of devices. And then you go from, you build circuits out of devices, and then you have microarchitecture, which is logic architecture on that. And ISN means you know, instruction set architecture, systems architecture, and networks. Uh, and then on top of that, you compile down to them. And then, of course, there's a boundary that uh, programmers typically use to, to write programs to this underlying stack. Okay. And the, uh, on top of that, of course, you have how you figure out uh, the, al the algorithms that you need for the applications that you want. But what's been really important for productivity and for us to make the, the enormous progress we've seen over the past five decades is that the, the lower part of this stack has produced consistently large exponential gains in capabilities. I mean, year after year after year after year, things just get faster and more efficient and faster and more efficient, largely invisible to the layers above. Now, if you, if you need uh, a level of performance, which is well beyond the capabilities of assist, you know, today's systems, you, you might wait or you might build yourself a supercomputer. Both of those take some time. Uh, but the, the important point is that the, uh, the incredible complexity underneath that line, all of the compiler transformations and optimizations and all of the new features added to the instruction set architecture and you know, now billions of transistors in the microarchitecture and the physics of those individual circuits and devices uh, are hidden from the software developers to, to first order. And so we've been able to move you know, orders and orders and orders of magnitude uh, largely under the covers. And that's really what's enabled these enormous gains in all of these different capabilities uh, and, and this vast increase in productivity. So that's the world we've been living in for the past 50 years. Okay. Now, the glory of Moore's law uh, is, is that it has been the fundamental driver of these capabilities. And I can't emphasize the importance of Moore's law enough. And I th think we all understand how important it's been. But it's been so consistent for such a long time that we almost take it for granted. You know, and, and a little bit like uh, you know, the Japanese yen, which is called the widowmaker trade and currency speculation, you know, predicting the demise of Moore's law has been a fool's errand for decades. Right? There have been papers proving that it can't go on much further. And then, of course, uh, the proofs had a flaw, and it keeps going. Uh, 
Uh, and so, you know, we almost take it for granted. And Bill, uh, in his keynote this morning, talked about how programming today isn't really all that different. Of course it's different, but, you know, fundamentally, you know, it's the same model as we had, you know, decades ago. So really, this has been largely invisible. Okay, so everyone knows about Moore's Law. Less commonly understood or known about outside of, outside of the, uh, the hardware fields is Denard scaling. So uh, Robert Denard in 19, and his colleagues at IBM in 1974 published a paper uh, that laid out a set of sc uh, scaling rules. And basically what he said is, okay, you're going to shrink a transistor from one generation to the next. Here's how you shrink a transistor. A transistor is just a switch. It conducts current you know, with an on-off uh, switch called the gate. A lot like a light switch, the gate is the, the switch that you toggle, uh, and then current will flow across the transistor or not. And uh, when you make them smaller, he set out a set of scaling rules where you scale everything proportionally. You scale the length by a factor of k, you scale the width by a factor of k, you drop the voltage by a factor of k, uh, you increase the dopant atoms in the channel by a factor of k, k is typically 1.4, and if you follow all these rules, you get a couple of really nice features. Number one is that you keep the uh, strength of the, the electric field across the gate insulator constant. So that's the constant that he, he drove to keep, things, uh, to keep things going. And you'll see down at the bottom there that power density uh, stays at one. So you shrink transistors, you pack double the number of transistors into an area, and power density stays the same, even though you're driving those circuits a lot faster. So it's almost like magic. You, know, you follow Denard's scaling rules, you get double the transistor count, the tra individual transistors get 40% faster, and they're 50% more efficient each, giving you a constant power density. And that's every time you turn the crank, which is pretty awesome. And again, you know, that paper was 1974. We had about three decades of Denard scaling. Okay? So this is really the, the underpinning rules that enables Moore's Law. Because if you didn't have this scaling, you'd be in trouble. Okay, so what's the catch? Well, there's a little problem in that Denard scaling is dead, okay? It's failed. And the reason that it's failed, uh, I'll go into in a moment. If we, look at the, if we look at the axes, you see the transistors on top in red. And this uh, was a really nice graph put together by my colleagues at Stanford, you know, Mark Horowitz, Kunle Lukerton, and others. Uh, you know, Moore's Law is alive and well. It's cranking up, you know, doubling of transistors every generation. And then while we were on this train, we saw in blue single thread performance kept increasing and the clock rates in green kept increasing. And you see the divergence between clock in green and single thread performance. That difference is ILP, instruction level parallelism. Um, but basically, we were getting exponential gains in single thread performance and exponential gains in frequency. And people were you know, juicing extra power to, to drive things faster than the efficiencies that Denard Scaling gave you because they wanted the performance because there was such a big economic incentive. Okay? But what happened was that the gate insulators got so small, you know, the, the, the oxide thickness, you know, small numbers of atoms, that it really became pos impossible to scale anymore. And so you couldn't drop down the threshold voltage and thereby the supply voltage without generating a lot of leakage. You know, it's like for your light switch analogy, it's like you buy a new light switch and either the, the light is always a little bit on even if you turn it off, or you reach and touch the switch and you get a shock. Okay, neither of those are desirable. So if you, if you tried to follow Denard's scaling rules past the point where it failed in the mid-2000s, 2004, 2005, you're just dissipating more and more current even when the transistor's not doing anything. It's called leakage or static power dissipation, and it's no good. Okay, so that really drove us to a non-regular or non-uniform scaling, and that's created all sorts of problems. Okay. Now, if you, if you shrink the number, if you shrink the transistors and you grow the, and you pack the transistors much more densely, but you don't get the corresponding energy efficiency, what you see is that power density starts to climb. And you're consuming more and more power uh, in a smaller area, which is more heat. And so there's really only a few ways to handle this. You can just keep powering the chip uh, more and more and you know, driving more and more cooling. You can uh, just hold off on power and leave the chip underpowered and not doing as much. Okay, but the, you, know, you don't really have a lot of good options. And so as a response in the mid-2000s, we saw industry go and uh, shift to multi-core to try to extract more efficiencies out of the transistors that they could power and keep driving performance forward. And that was a major shift uh, caused in part by this uh, failure of Denard scaling. Okay, so is multi-core the answer? 
You know, there was a consensus in my community around 2008, 2009 that multi-core was going to save us, that it was, you know, we were just on this path of scaling cores and they double every generation with the transistor counts and pretty soon we'd have chips with a thousand high performance cores on them uh, and everything would be fine and dandy. And as long as we learned how to do efficient parallel programming, we'd be fine. Of course, that's very hard. Um, so I was really interested in this question. And so uh, my group and collaborators published a paper in ISCA 2011 uh, that talked about both dark silicon and the feasibility of multi-core scaling in this power-dominated area of disproportionate transistor scaling. And, uh, and the question we asked is, what happens to multi-core performance when you're packing more and more transistors on the chip and using them to generate or increase the number of cores, uh, and then you, you can't drive them as fast because of the power limits, so what do you actually get? Okay? And you know, I should say that, that in, this, in this era, even when you're power limited, work, because we have these cores, work on better parallel programming, uh, more better parallel languages, more efficient parallel architectures is still really important because it gives us extra performance for free. Just like work on single threaded performance is still really important and, and work on energy efficiency for single threaded performance and parallel execution is still really important. All of those are in fact even more important now because we're not getting the freebies out of the transistors. Okay, so there's just an enormous amount of great work going on in parallel programming. Uh, a lot of it being done you know, in, our, in MSR's collaborations with Berkeley and other places. And that work remains, I would say, not even as important as it was, but more important now. Okay, that being said, we did a study that said, given some different technology scaling assumptions, how much were we going to get out of more cores? Okay? And so the, the uh, vertical axis there is speed up, basically, how much performance do we get, given a fixed power and area budget. And then the, the x-axis is years. The blue line is actually historical performance brought forward. So that's, that's what we got in the last 10 years. So, so meeting that line would be doing as well uh, this decade to come as we did in that past decade. And we made two sets of technology scaling assumptions. What we call ITRS scaling, that's the Semiconductor Industry Association that puts out a roadmap about how well we're going to do. And their projections, I think, are way optimistic. And in fact, we're starting to see that now that they've been They've been much too optimistic as we've fallen off of this curve. And then the, the, the line below it uh, is what we call realistic scaling. And it looks really like that's what we're tracking now. OK, so you know, we're, we're maybe small changes, but we're pretty on the mark on that one. And so over 10 years, if you're following the realistic scaling curve, four parallel applications, assuming that you have the optimal multi-core topology for each individual parallel application, you get a speed up of under four over 10 years. Okay, and you know, historically the speed ups have been higher than even 18x, you know, but we started to slow down in the last 10 years. So this really says that there's really not that much juice left in multi-core. Now that's absent, there could be a big, a big breakthrough in transistors, uh, certainly that's possible. There could be a great breakthrough in architecture or parallel languages that give us 99.9% you know, .9 parallelism. So there are things that could happen that would shift this curve up, okay? But given a set of fairly optimistic assumptions, you know, we're looking at this. So uh, now there are a number of ways to deal with this problem of having too little power to power your whole chip. Okay? And there's really three. One is that you can say, well, I'm just going to burn the power and build an expensive cooling and you know, have liquid cooling in my PC and then my pocket. Okay? There's some economic challenges with that, not to mention a different kind of leakage. Um, we could decide just to turn off part of the chip and leave it dark. This is why people talk about this being dark silicon. And part of the chip stays lit. And so you just switch over to whichever part of the chip you need and you build a thousand special purpose accelerators and you just light up the five that you need at any one time. Okay, we call that Franken chip. Uh, doesn't sound very productive for software. That's a second option. A third option is just to make the chip smaller. And if you make your chips smaller, on a nonlinear scale with each generation, you have an explosion in supply and not much of a jump in capability. And that really changes the economics of the industry. Okay, and I think we're going to see the third option being the most likely. All right, so, so that's also going to put some pressure on, on silicon scaling. Okay, so all this multi-core work is really important, but it's not going to be the driving force generating the sort of gains that we've seen in the past. At least that's my belief.
Okay, so I thought it would, it would be interesting just to give some context and take a look at the past to see how we got here. So, I mean, th these aren't anybody's names other than names I thought up for this talk, and I'm sure they're not entirely accurate. But, you know, you can think of the th late 30s to through the 40s with, uh, you know, Eckert and Mockley and Turing and von Neumann. It's what I call the age of discovery. This is when they discovered not only a lot of the results about computability, but really laid, laid the foundations of the execution models that we're dealing with now. The stored program concepts, von Neumann computing, instruction fetch, uh, all of this sort of thing. You know, was really laid down by these giants in this period. So this, is, this was, as one of my colleagues said, you know, an, an era where giants walked the earth. And then you know, in, the, in the late 50s through the 60s and early 70s, what I call the, area, the era of invention. These are things when a lot of the, the basic concepts that we take for granted were invented. Things like caches, uh, you know, out of order execution, virtual memory, uh, stable instruction sets so you can reuse software from one machine to the next. You know, these, these were all developed in that period. And then, you know, starting in the late 70s and through the 80s, we had an era of integration where we started building single, single chip computers, which were, at first were microcontrollers, and then we pulled more and more stuff onto those dies. Uh, and then once we had integrated the things we knew how to integrate, caches, floating point units, we went to an era of ILP. We started going to out-of-order execution, deep pipelines, very fast clocks, and drove the performance of these, what at the time were called killer micros, way up. That ran out of steam because of Denard scaling as well as we hit a lot of limits on efficiency, and we shifted to multi-core. And I think that multi-core shift, you know, starting in about 2004, will really have run its course you know, in, in the next couple of years, 2016 or so. And so the question is really what comes next? What are we going to use to drive this next big wave of computing? And this is the paradigm shift that, that I'm asking about. You know, where is this next level of performance and efficiency going to come from? Okay, and that's what I'll talk about in the rest of the talk. So there are certainly some candidates. One is that we can start specializing logic. Neural computing is a great candidate. I'll talk about both of those. Uh, my wonderful colleague Krista is going to be talking, you know, has a, is talking about quantum and uh, that runs very cold. Interestingly, interestingly Denard uh, in a recent paper said that you can actually keep scaling the voltage if you keep scaling the, the temperature down with it. Okay, so you know, we go to minus 50, minus 60 centigrade, da 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 da. That provides a scaling path. It provides some other, takes uh, some other challenges and engineering feats too, and it's not something I want to have in my pocket. Okay, but, but this, this era of X, what X is, is a really important question. And it may not be just one thing, but it's coming soon. And I think that's the message that I'd like to convey today that we really have to work on figuring out what X is, and X is gonna require breaking a lot of the traditional barriers down. Okay, so let me start uh, the first candidate, which is specialization. So it's well known, this is a sort of a classic graph that's widely used that Bob Broderson at Berkeley put together a while back. He took uh, a number of chips from the ISSCC proceedings between 1997 and 2001 and categorized them by function and efficiency. So on the Y axis, you basically have energy efficiency, and on the x-axis, you have just they've sorted the processors based on how efficient they are. And the category in the left is general purpose microprocessors. These are the things that are nice and easy to program and they run everything. They just run everything very inefficiently. But as long as the party's still going, we don't care. Okay, digital signal processors in the middle, they get between a factor of 10, 50, 100x efficiency. And then dedicated hardware or ASICs, application specific integration circuits that do one function run between a factor of 100 and 1,000 more efficient than a general purpose processor. Okay, so by specializing the logic just in circuits to the, to the function that you want to execute, you can already reap large gains in efficiency over where we are today. And this is no surprise. This is well known in the computer science community. Okay, there are a, uh, a couple of intermediate points though. Um, you know, ASICs, are, like I said, are up there at the top. There are FPGAs, which are really interesting devices that are basically programmable logic. So they, have, they express their logic not in you know, AND and OR gates mapped down to transistors, but in lookup tables that express logic functions. And you can wire together a whole bunch of lookup tables to generate larger and more complex functions. And these give you, you know, a, a jump of, say, 100x over a general purpose core, uh, but they're reprogrammable. But you pay a factor of 10 over an ASIC. OK, so there's some really interesting possibilities there. Now, I think as I alluded in the last slide, 
uh, there are more gains the lower you go. And, and the last graph was really useful for understanding the disparity of efficiency on existing chips. Uh, but let's understand the space of possibilities as we start to think about specialization and new execution models. Okay, so I think of code specialization as giving you potentially an order of magnitude. And obviously these are very rough numbers. Code specialization is things like taking a multi-core chip and rewriting your single-threaded application to run over 16 processors. If you do it well, you might get a speed up of 10x. Okay, and this is on a single machine. Obviously, if you have many machines, uh, the gains are, are potentially higher. Okay, logic specialization, as we saw in the last slide, can give you a, another order of magnitude. Okay, so by customizing your circuits, you can maybe go down to a factor of 100 or more uh, over, over general processors. That's a lot of work, okay? And we don't, we don't have any way to currently to do that product productively. If you go down the next level to circuit specialization, uh, you can start doing things like analog circuits that, uh, that are not you know, Boolean gates, but are representing actual functions. Uh, these, of course, you're starting to leave did the digital domain. Uh, and, of course, you, there are some things you can do and stay in the digital domain. But there's another order of magnitude there. And, and when you start going down into devices, using actual small devices that compute different functions, there's even another order of magnitude there. Okay, so if you're looking at you know, ion mobility in an ion transport memory, which is 10 nanometers across, they have some very interesting properties as a function of the current flowing through and the resistance in the state of the cell. Okay, so we can build devices that give us a lot more, uh, but we, right now we have no way to specify them or use them at higher levels of the system. Okay, so the first two layers, I would argue, are sort of what we understand. They're Boolean, they're digital, they're easy, uh, they're hard to do well maybe, but but down at the lower levels, that's where the big gains are. Okay, and the question is really, how are we going to marry those lower levels up to the software stacks that have been so productive and so stable for so long? Okay, so starting with logic synthesis, going down to that second order of magnitude by specializing the logic, uh, there are large gains in efficiency if you can start to specify your software functions down on logic as opposed to a general purpose processor. Uh, now, that becomes a spatial thing. I mean, you're, you're not running a function through a stream of in instructions through a processor. You're actually laying down the code uh, completely concurrent, you know, data flow-like uh, on a collection of communicating state machines where everything is running at once. It's fundamentally a very fine-grained concurrent language or model. Uh, and, you know, again, 100x for FPGAs or something called coarse grain reconfigurable arrays, which are more like spatial arrays of functional units connected with various types of networks. Uh, than 1,000x for ASICs. But the development and compilation for specialized logic is an enormous challenge. I mean, people have been at this a long time. We've made slow progress. Uh, but what's really interesting and starting to change is that these fabrics of programmable logic are no longer just the raw logic lookup tables that you have to put a circuit down onto. The, the major vendors, you know, Altera and Xilinx, there are a host of other companies working on this, are now starting to put down things like functional units uh, uh, clusters of functional units in a sea of reconfigurable logic around them. And they're starting to stamp out processor cores with a sea of reconfigurable logic and functional units around them. And memory blocks with a sea of processor cores and functional units. So we're getting this very interesting stew of cores and programmable logic and functional units and memory blocks. And it's a substrate that's much richer than the old kind of standard just here's a bunch of programmable gates. And, and there are a lot of work going on in tools to map down to that. Altera has a, a stack called OpenCL, which is really uh, a standard to map kind of data parallel types of languages down to graphics and other accelerators. And now they're targeting this interesting stew. Xilinx has a product called AutoESL, which is much more sort of logic programming coming up and trying to make you more productive. And whether they meet in the middle or something else comes and, and, and uh, provides productivity is a really interesting question. So we see really uh, interesting mixes of these functional units and these tools in this stew. So I think we're going to see some breakthroughs here. I think we're going to start to see wide adoption, uh, and maybe in niche areas at first. But this will be a, a candidate for getting us past uh, some of these challenges that we're seeing on the scaling domain. And then I think you know, given how fast workloads change in the cloud, we're like, much more likely to see programmable logic there first, and then things like CGRAs or many more types of ASICs in the client which need that extra energy efficiency and have sort of more predictable workloads, uh, you know, since you're replacing the devices and not rolling out new services as option.
as often. Okay, so that's specialized logic, but what, what is the challenge here? Well, it's got great potential in the short, short term. We have a lot of challenges at the language and algorithm and application barrier. I mean, exposing this to software programmers has historically been very hard, but it's a problem we have to tackle. And we need help, we hardware people need help from the higher levels of the system in figuring out what sort of concurrent languages can actually make this productive. Uh, what libraries and data transport frameworks and fabrics can we use to sort of select a flow from a pre-orchestrated library and then plug a bunch of kernels in. Uh, but it leaves these other two levels unaddressed. You know, I mean, there are uh, field programmable analog arrays, but they're really niche right now, and this says nothing about devices. And this is where the big speed ups are. Okay, so what can we do to attack these levels? There's another issue, issue here, which is that in the logic specialization space, you know, you have efficiency, you have a spectrum, and you have efficiency on the far right, okay, ASICs at the extreme. You have generality, what we think of as CPUs on the far left, uh, and you can think of that as inefficiency in the extreme. And then going from left to right, of course, we start with CPUs, then you have multi-core CPUs, and then many core CPUs, and then GPUs, and then FPGAs, and then ASICs, right? So the farther, the farther right you go, the less general you get and the more work it is to map, and, but the more efficient you get. And this tension is not something that we know how to resolve today, but we need to make progress. So I'm hoping that these software tools for mapping down to these interesting substrates will help us to make a lot of progress. But how do we resolve this tension in a more fundamental way? Or what, what, is, the, what is the hook that's going to give us an added advantage that we didn't have before? Because people have been at this a long time. Okay, so a final comment, you know, is that if you look at Moore's Law, and, and uh, thanks to Shekhar Borkar at, at Intel for this chart he gave me a while back, you know, we're, we're currently at, at uh, 22 nanometers, moving to 16 uh, or 14 if you're Intel. Uh, for, for reference, you know, a silicon atom, you know, in, in a matrix is a, about two and a half angstroms. So we're looking at, you know, think of four per nanometer. Okay, so by the time we get down to four nanometers, we're looking at transistors that are 16 atoms across. Okay, that's the long way. The, the short way is the gate on top. Okay, so uh, there's an economic imperative to extract performance from these generations of transistors. We're not getting the free scaling and energy efficiency anymore, and the power density is climbing. Uh, in addition, we're starting to pay more and more of a tax for the digital rep abstraction. You know, because these transistors are getting leakier, they're getting noisier, there's more variance, they fail more often. Okay, at, at each step you take down, you're getting closer to the atomic domain, and we're pretty close already, and things just get very, very tough down there. You know, quantum tunneling, high-velocity high electrons, uh, just, you know, process variation, you're manufacturing, you know, hundreds of billions of transistors, okay, with small numbers of atoms. Okay, so we pay a fairly high tax to get a clean digital representation with enough band gaps to keep things functioning as they should be. And the challenge is that at some point along this road, as you get down to single atoms, that tax becomes too high. Okay? You know, you're, you're, you're not going to build a stable digital transistor out of a single atom. Okay? And so at some point here, that tax becomes too high. And if you don't figure something else out to do with those transistors, that stops the scaling. So I think we hit an economic end long before we hit a physics base end. We may be able to manufacture them, but we have to be able to extract value from them to justify the tens of billions of dollars that you need to move to the next process node, because every node is getting harder. Now during this time, so this is sort of the danger zone as I see it. I'm guessing, you know, 11, but probably eight is where we're gonna run into serious economic challenges without some new model, okay? During this time, of course, DRAM is likely to die but that doesn't mean progress is over. We're gonna be making a lot of progress on denser non-volatile technologies, 3D stacking, integration of multiple technology into a package. So there's gonna be a lot of stuff happening through this and even after, even after Moore's Law is quote unquote over. So it's not an end of progress, but the question is how do we harness these nasty, noisy devices uh, in a way to provide better performance and the economics to keep scaling going as long as we, can phys as long as we physically can. Okay, so I think there's an opportunity to break this digital tyranny, okay, of this, of this abstraction of ones and zeros that served us so well for 50, for 60 years, okay? And that's to go to embrace approximation. Some people call it analog, some people call it approximation. Okay, this is, you know, there's a lot of great debate going on in the community right now. You know, we've tried this, it's too hard, it's black magic, okay? But the world is different now. 
Not only do we have an enormous economic incentive, our workloads have changed. We're doing enormous numbers of things that, that intersect with the analog world, our world, in fundamental ways. And so if you look at that list of applications, or classes of applications, you know, large-scale machine learning, vision, bioinformatics, mining big data, speech, AI, NUI, these are all things that you know, take, an, in some sense, an analog input or produce an analog output or have many possible answers. These are things where you can afford some imprecision. These are things where you can afford some error. In fact, you can afford a lot if you have the right algorithms, if you have the right convergence. Okay, as an example, uh, my group is working with a very interesting uh, workload internally that we're trying to accelerate. We had 400,000 thresholds in this workload, uh, represented as 32-bit floating point numbers. And you know, we wanted to make it more efficient. So we just did a quick thing. We just took uh, all but 1,600 of them, so 3, 398,400 of those thresholds. We just dropped them to 20 bits. Okay? The other 1,600, we said, oh, those look big. We'll leave them alone. We won't even try to mess with them. Uh, and we saw no reduction in the quality of our output. Okay? We don't actually know how low we can go. And I'm guessing for each of those, you know, for each of those thresholds that's carving out a different part of the space, uh, it'll be a little bit different. We have no formal way to deal with that. Right? We, don't have the, we don't have the models, we don't have the mathematics, we don't have the language support. You know, we're doing this all by hand and by trial and error, and it's really time consuming and messy. But there's a huge opportunity there. You know, we just dropped the precision by a third for almost all of them, and it was free. Okay, this is no surprise to people that work in machine learning. Right? You know, sometimes you need single precision floating point, sometimes you need double, but very often you need far, far less than that. Okay, so these workloads can be very robust to produce, reduce precision, and they can allow us to start computing with circuits and potentially eventually devices uh, that are far more efficient than what we have today, but we need the right abstractions to reason about how much error can you tolerate, how much noise is acceptable, what function are you trying to drive through, how do you map that onto the functions, how do we characterize their distribution, what if we have dynamic noise, uh, how do we manage all this? And right now we have no idea, okay? But the potential is there. There's huge opportunities. The workloads are amenable. So, but we need help from across the stack, okay? And I'd like to thank, you know, point out that this is uh, both this approximate computing work as well as the work I'm about to talk, talk about was in close partnership with Louis Cesse at University of Washington who has a great program in approximate computing. He's really driving this work. Hadi is my alzada as our student who did a lot of the work, Adrian Sampson and others. So thanks to them for uh, giving me some of the material on the slide. So if I think about approximate computing and energy efficiency, you know, here I show a Pareto frontier. On the y-axis I have energy going up as we go up, and then performance uh, going to the right on the x-axis. And you can take a bunch of processor designs and compute that frontier, and you can always buy a little bit of performance for a disproportionate more energy, right? It's a nonlinear curve. So if I want that extra little bunch of performance, it's going to cost me some more energy. And so we, of course, try to move down and to the right with better designs, more efficient architectures. That's, that's the, sort of the bread and the butter of my community. But, but with this approximation, we have a great opportunity. We can add a third axis of error, order and precision. And now instead of a Pareto frontier, we get a Pareto surface. Okay? And the shape of this surface for each of these workloads is at this point completely unknown. All right, we have no idea how far we can push this. Okay? But once you're willing to take a little bit of error and you, and you break, again, this digital tyranny, you can start using these devices that are noisy and you don't have to pay that enormous tax to guarantee a one or a zero. Okay? Now, of course, there are points on the surface that don't make sense. Right? I mean, I can get you know, zero energy and infinite performance if I'm willing to take enough error. Right? I just pick a result and I'm done with the computation. So clearly that doesn't make sense. Uh, but there are, there are a lot of really interesting points on this. So I'll talk about one kind of very incremental step we've taken in this direction next. Um, and that's taking von Neumann computing and transforming it to neural networks. Okay, which this was a really surprising result for us. We didn't think it would be this, work this well. So on the, on the left, and this is again, his work with uh, Luis, Cesar, Hadi, and Adrian. Uh, so on the left here, there's sort of a standard control flow graph of a traditional imperative program, C, C++, whatever you want. We find some target region which is well-structured, so well-defined inputs and outputs, no side effects, a lot, lot like functional programming. Okay? And <coughs> then in our compiler, 
we actually have a unit that observes it. Okay, so we train a neural network. It observes the inputs, it observes the outputs. We run this over lots of input sets. We interpolate inputs uh, and then run them through if we don't have enough input sets to work with. And, and then, of course, we test it against a real set after we train it. Um, and what it turns out is that you know, if you pick the topology of a standard you know, artificial neural network, or ANN, uh, based on the workload, you can actually do really well. You want a different topology for each one, of course. Obviously, if you give them all a giant topology, you know, they'll be good in the limit, but then you, you pay a lot of inefficiency. For small functions, you can, you can use a small topology. For really large functions, you need a much bigger topology with more hidden layers. And